Well, welcome everybody to another session in our Women Lead Online Forums brought to you by Connected Women of Influence. I'm Patty Vargas, I'm your host today, and today we are in the ladies' room. You know, that place where women talk about things that we might not say just anywhere, things that we can only say to one another because, well, because we've had shared experiences. This is our opportunity to talk about it maybe vent some frustrations, give advice to one another, and, and come away with some new ideas or validation. Because in the ladies' room, we go there. Now our session today lasts for an hour. If you've joined with video, you will be able to see our panelists and attendees alike. Questions and comments are always welcome. If you have something you'd like to contribute anonymously, just put it in the chat, in the chat to me and I will share it for you. Now, our topic today is who invented likability and who benefits from that? And I'm really excited to introduce our special guests today. Let me tell you a little bit about each one of them. First, we have Jill Carpenter, who is the Vice President of Marketing at Cirrus Insight. And Jill has responsibility for accelerating corporate growth, expanding market share, and guiding product roadmaps. As a leader, she is passionate about mentoring and supporting their growing staff and encouraging their professional success. And she likes to say, I love this, our collective commitment to our customers is at the core of everything we do. So right on, Jill. Welcome. Secondly, we have Linda Patton. Linda has been a leader and has developed leadership training and other leaders for more than 40 years. She started when she was just a teeny weeny little girl. Linda's accomplished in leadership development and performance consulting and she retired at the rank of major from the US Army, which is where she learned many of her leadership tips and strategies. Linda also released her book, No One Stood Up When I Entered the Room Today and already achieved Amazon best-selling status. So woo, welcome Linda. And finally, we have Chris Noel. Chris is the CEO of TNT LLC, a consulting agency. TNT's mission is to empower entrepreneurs and small businesses through financial freedom, organizational clarity, and team engagement. TNT believes that empowered humans seek to empower other humans. Right on. So, welcome, Chris. So this topic, I mean, what, what got me going on this topic? What made me want to, to talk about this? Well, it seems to me that there's just an equity in how we view men, women, and likability. And, you know, before even considering a woman for a newscast, she's subjected to a likability assessment. And I don't know that we ever do that for men. And if you just look at the, the Democratic presidential candidates, 25% of them at the start were female, but we're still talking about likability like we did when Hillary ran in 2008. And there's been some studies that have found that when women are successful in male-dominated fields, they are deemed less likable. For whatever reason, the fact that they're successful or that they're knowledgeable is what makes them less likable. So go figure. So let's go there, ladies. I want to know what you guys think of this. I want to know what your, uh, what your thoughts, what your opinions are about this. And, and let's, just, let's just go there. Anybody can start. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I know all of you have lots of opinions. <laughs> yeah. Um, Patty, I really love the article that you sent about not very likable. Here's how bias is affecting women leaders. Yeah. Um, because the, I, I talk so much about the fact that we're mentored by men right now. And so we learn the masculine art of leadership, mm -hmm. which is all around competitions, organizations, support, you know, that kind of thing. And a little bit of greed, um, just to, you know, throw that into the mix. And they don't know what to do with the feminine side of leadership, which is all around um, compassion and empathy and collaboration, creativity, those kinds of things. And so we get this, oh, she's going to be too emotional. We can't possibly have her in a leadership position. And 
I love the article, you know, stated all the great statistics, like only 6% of CEOs are women, mm -hmm. which is just criminal. So, you know, it, it, that has to change, if nothing else. The fact that the blending, uh, and this is what, the, I'm sorry, this is what the book's about, is the blending and the marriage of the masculine leadership with the feminine leadership and creating what I politely call calm fluential leadership. So it's taking the masculine command with the feminine influence and bringing them together. And that can be really powerful. And it can be on either side. A man can also be confluential, as obviously can a woman. And I think it's, at least for me, it's the best way to get the best of both worlds and truly make some changes in what's going on in the, the whole field of work and being able to make change in the world as well. My opinion. Mm -hmm. Great, great, totally agree, totally agree. I mean, you know, do we, you know, Elizabeth Warren came out, do you remember when she, before she announced she was running and, and she had the, um, she was being interviewed and she was having a beer, you know, and she was sitting out there and she was drinking this beer and, and she was, uh, talking about her platform and what she, you know, was believed, believed in and so forth. And the next day in the paper was, I don't know if I find this woman likable. I don't know if I'd want to have a beer with her. And, you know, I, I, and actually when I read that article, I thought, oh my God, here we go again. Here we go again. It's, it's, you know, we're back into all of that. Like, why is that even a thing? You know, I mean, what, why does that still come up? I think that's a heavy question. Um, it's very loaded on many levels. I So in the last form I, I was in, I gave a different viewpoint. Um, my dad was the stay-at-home dad, and my mom was the breadwinner of the family. And my mom is a computer engineer, so she was in a very male-dominated field. Um, so I think that I'm a unicorn, basically, with how I was raised and what my viewpoint is. Um, same with my marriage. My husband is home a lot of times with the children while I am off um, creating an empire. Um, I, but the likability thing is big. I am an accountant in and in a, it is a, a male dominated field as well as doing a lot of HR stuff. So um, I think I'm going to speak personally to what you just brought up, Patty, but I think it's the same thing. Whenever I walk into a, a situation or something, um, very often it is, I wasn't, you're not what I expected because my name is Chris, C-R-Y-S. So a lot of times they do think they're going to be meeting a man. And then I walk in with my hair and tattoos and I'm a woman. Um, and I'm a CEO of a, a very, it's a great company. So, um, the likability thing though, I think that it's, some of it's cognitive dissonance where people are programmed to believe that women have to be quiet and meek and sit in a box. Um, and how do we counteract that is I think we just keep showing up as who we are authentic men, women, um, kind of what Linda said, um, there is a, a yin and yang and both of those have to fit together well, be it a man or a woman. Um, so I, I really, that's, that's how I show up pretty much. I am highly emotional, um, in a very logical field. So I just, I just keep showing up that way, but how it keeps coming into the paper is that we're going to need men that talk and say that's inappropriate, that's wrong, um, respect respect the boundaries that have been laid out, and she's a woman, um, and as long as she's showing up and being respectful on her terms, then um, hopefully she's, she's doing us proud. Mm -hmm. You mentioned something really important that I found in my life as well, that you had a strong female mentor role model. Mm -hmm. Um, I did as well. My mom always worked. She worked in high-powered jobs, and she role modeled a lot of the confidence and ability to show up as yourself um, that I hope I show when I show up at work. Um, so that really helped, and that certainly fueled in my life my desire to mentor other people, you know, for people who didn't have a mom that was that great role model. Um, to provide that out there. And I totally agree with you that everybody has to step up. It can't just be women saying we, you know, want more visibility. 
we need allies to help us. Mm -hmm. But I also think we can help across other women um, in the way that you, you mentioned that your mom helped, you know, provided a role model for you. Mm -hmm. um, just a couple things came up for this. Chris, I thank you so much for what you said. Um, my mom also worked in, uh, unfortunately or fortunately, um, she was a secretary, but she was the um, top secretary in the lab. And so she basically ran everybody else, which I thought was absolutely amazing at the time. Um, but I think we, we also get stuck in our gender heritage. You know, I don't know about you, but I was told, first of all, I had to be perfect and I, I needed to be quiet and in the background and I needed to know 100% of the job before I could take it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, those <laughs> kinds of things. And I think we get caught in that as well. I mean, in doing some uh, mentoring with women who have lost jobs. I had a, a project manager who had lost her job and she said, I don't understand. You know, I, I'm better than the, the men that are still there, but they let me go. And I said, well, tell me about your job. And she said, well, I used to bring projects to my boss. And he'd say, gee, this is really great. Let me take a look at this. And the next thing I knew, the guy next door had the job. And she said, I didn't understand. I didn't know why. I said, did you ever tell your boss that you wanted to be the project lead? Oh, no, I would never do that. I don't put myself forward. Mm -hmm. to something else we don't do. We don't tell people that we want this, that we're, we're excited about it. I had more women who were out of jobs because they never put their hand up and said, I want that job. Mm -hmm. I can do that job. And men, I think, if I remember right, the statistic is if they know 15 to 20% of the job, they'll go for it. So we need to break through our gender heritage in order to be more likable or at least be able to, to sit at the table and actually speak. Jill, I love what you said about mentoring because I think right now that's, that's a role that is sadly lacking that I know I was mentored by men. And I, I can be honest that obviously in the military, I had mostly men mentoring me. Mm -hmm. I did have some glorious women when I was at Fort McClellan because it was the home of the Women's Army Corps. Um, but they taught me the command side and they taught it very, very, very well. What we need to mentor now is the influence side and how to blend those, as I've said. But I think the key is we're not doing that. We don't, either we don't know how, or we just don't want to step into that. But I know there are women out there who would kill to have you, Jill, as a mentor, or Chris as a mentor. And it's like, how do I find you? How do I get you as my mentor? Um, I know when I was mentored in corporate, one of the things I did when I finished the contract with a particular mentor, I'd say, who do you think I should go to next? Who's the next likely person to do that? And again, we, we don't have those career paths any longer. I, I worry about the millennials and the fact that they're not being mentored. They don't have career paths. And it appears that there's not a really clear road for them to travel to do what they want to do and be what they want to be. And Chris and Jill, I'd love, Patty, I'd love a comment on that because I'm, I'm, that's sort of how I'm feeling about it. Um, that is what TNT does. We mentor quite a few people. So um, we work heavily with businesses. Uh, again, we come in, we mentor and do a lot of leadership workshops. I agree with your statement that we don't know how or we don't step into it. Apprenticing someone is incredibly difficult. It's a commitment on both sides. And the things that we're unconsciously competent in we don't even realize we do, so it's really hard to teach it. So it's, an, it's a level of intentionality that most people don't know how to step into. Um, so I would agree 100% on that. Um, the likability is something else as well to factor in here, right? We seek people who are similar to us to learn from them instead of seeking people who are opposite of us to learn from them. Because the clashing of those voices, you learn more from that than someone who's almost the same as you, who's a mirror. Um, but I work with a ton of millennials and the ones I work with are achievers and are very excited to learn and grow and um, are asking the hard questions and are willing to have the challenge with the connection. 
Um, so for me, in the bubble that I'm in, um, the millennials are very happy to have a path. They want to do their own thing, but they love, and their ideas are like, oh, they're like diamonds in the rough. I just love working with millennials. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. I, I found them to be very motivated. One thing that I've done frequently in hiring is use tools like, well, in the old days, it was Myers-Briggs, mm -hmm. but now it's DISC. And that's not to put people in a box, right? But it definitely, when I hire people, I want, really want to hire for my weaknesses, right? I don't need to hire someone who's like me. I can do me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and do it well. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, and, um, and that's been really helpful. And we've expanded that out through our organization. And it's also been helpful in opening eyes to that whole concept that you really don't have to just hire people who know, I don't know, the baseball scores like you do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you can hire people, um, as you all have alluded to, that are um, maybe a little different, maybe have a different perspective, but still bring that same enthusiasm and attitude and aptitude to do a good job. Well, Julie, yeah. I think that's, that's a piece that, you know, I, I talk to entrepreneurs about mm -hmm. too, is don't hire someone like you. Hire yeah, someone yeah. who completes you. That's, that's so, a sign of leadership. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So you'll look for those folks who, as you said, Jill, the things I can't do, the things right. I don't yeah. want to do, the things I don't like to do, that, those are the folks you want in your organization. And they will also challenge you to be your very best. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the people that don't do that is because they're threatened by the skills mm -hmm. that somebody else brings to the table. Yeah. Um, I, you know, years and years ago in corporate, I worked for Linda Morrow. Some of you guys know Linda. And that was one thing that she taught me was she goes, I always look for the people who have the, the skills or the talents or the capabilities that I don't have, because I'm looking for who's going to carry this ball forward, you know, and, and who can replace me in the future. Insecure leaders don't do that. Mm -hmm. You know, but to go back to, to what you guys were saying about the millennials, I teach for American Management Association. And when I teach what's called their open workshops, there's people in the workshops from all these different companies. And, you know, it's a grab bag. I don't know what I'm going to get. I walk into the class and, you know, there's anywhere from eight to 20 people there. And they're from all these different companies, all these different ages. Um, and it's, it's just like back when Gen X was rising up, you know, and I would have employees that were complaining about Gen X, oh, they have no work ethic and all they want to do is be on their computer. And now the Gen Xers are all complaining about the millennials, you know, right. and, and so I, I try to bring out to, the, no matter what the course is that I'm talking, because they're always related to leadership and communication, but no matter what it is, it's always, look, you guys, look what you all bring to the table together you know look what the millennials bring look what the older older generation brings you know and oh my god last week i was teaching a class and i was the oldest generation i mean they were all younger than me and i was like but here's what here's the shared experiences and the not shared experiences and this is why it makes our relationships so rich you know but but to in this idea of of likability and you know it's interesting that you brought up about millennials and so forth is that this idea, this concept of are they likable seems to be out in the ether somewhere. You know, it's not necessarily when you're talking one on one with people. And, and knowing that this show was coming up this week, you know, I was asking some of my millennials in the class the other day what do you guys think about likability? They didn't even know what I was talking about, they, it had never entered their minds that somebody wouldn't, would judge them for not being likable. Um, and I thought, man, that is, maybe there is hope for the future, you know, that, um, that as, as some of this, maybe it's bleeding out. I, I don't know. What do you guys think about that? That they don't see gender? No, that they don't necessarily see these concepts of likability and um and stereotypes maybe hmm. i would say that they are probably unconsciously incompetent in that i think that from a very young age um it surrounds us 
So, I mean, my son's 14 and he still worries about if people like him or not, but he would never term it to likability factor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that it's a catchphrase maybe, um, but I would still say that while I come into businesses and the, the millennials, they have a much easier time working with a woman boss. I think that that's not, that friction is not there anymore so much um, for that generation. Mm -hmm. So I, I would say definitely, like they don't, they don't have the same expectations or stereotypes or sexism that other generations have. Yeah. Well, you know, there, I'm not sure if I shared this article with you guys before, um, but it was contrasting Tiffany Haddish. You know, she's a comedian, mm. an actress and a comedian. And she did a stand-up in, in Florida. I think it was New Year's Eve. And she bombed. She was hungover. She wasn't at her best. You know, she, she said things she shouldn't have said, lost track what she was doing. Anyway, she was she's not at her best. And, and they just raked her over the coals in the, in the, in the press, you know, she, her, her claim to fame, her hashtag is she ready? And they were hashtagging she not ready, you know, it was just all over the place. But the same weekend, Pete Davidson also performed a stand up and he was high on mushrooms at the time and he was drunk and he was stumbling all over the place. And the way that they played it up in the, in the news reports, in the reviews was, you know, that he struggled with substance abuse and, and so forth. And he finally found his, his stride and it was a really funny set. So two, the only difference between the two was that one was male and one was female. They were having a similar situation, I guess, you know, you would say, and, and uh, what was it that made the press forgivable or more forgiving of him and less forgiving of her. What was the difference? None, but they perceived they perceived a difference. I think there was a a, a, t a television anchors, and one was female, one was male, and the the woman had worn the same outfit like two days in a row or something like that. <laughs> um, for whatever reason, her dresser gave her the same suit. A second day and the media just as you said raked her over the coals oh my god she was in the same suit two days in a row how can you do that you know and like Hillary with the red suit yeah and so her anchor her male anchor decided he was going to test that so he literally wore the same suit the same tie the same shirt every day I think for a week yeah. and nobody <laughs> mentioned it at all so he made you know a very public comment about why why is it different? I wore I did exactly what she did and for a longer period of time, and none of you had a comment about that. But you raked her over the coals. What why the difference? Mm -hmm. Other than the fact that she's a woman and I'm a man. Yeah. So I, I think there's still a bit of that. Um, I love the fact that the millennials are not per perceiving it that way, but it's still very much out there mm -hmm. that we hold a different standard for the women than we do the men. Mm -hmm. um, I was, can I say something? <laughs> um, I, I have five grown children and four of which are grown daughters. And I, there's two sides for the likability for me is the, the girls need to learn the likability from the emotional standpoint. And when dealing with men, it's a likability from a confidence standpoint and teaching them how to speak and, and be articulate. And then the emotional side is actually what I teach my girls is embrace that. It's an actual a positive thing, but we, the society doesn't look like, doesn't, doesn't uh, kind of embrace it. But I say that's an actual added uh, bonus. Now harness that mm -hmm. and use it to your benefit. Mm -hmm. And what we need to do as leaders, mothers, women, is teach those that are younger how, what, in whatever, whether your kids or an intern or whatever employees, just teach them how to harness those emotions and use it to their benefit and to their advancement. And then also teach them how to speak 
to, to, to men and how to articulate what you want to get through. Anyway, that's what I wanted to say. Mm -hmm. I love that movie. I, um, I have two millennial daughters as well, and they're powerful, badass women, and I just am having so much fun watching them do what they do uh, because I pat myself on the back. I mean, we I, I taught them to be that way. <laughs> Susie, been... turn your mic up. Can't oh. hear you much. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> me... I want to hear about your badass daughters. <laughs> <laughs> just talk so louder I have, two millennial daughters. I have two millennial daughters and they're they're just badass and I can't I, I I am living vicariously through them I didn't have that and it's so much fun to see them not even care about likability like mm -hmm. really you know hmm. Monica brings up a really good point which is we have a secret superpower um, that a lot of times we have higher EQ than our coworkers. Mm -hmm. And so we can motivate people and we can bring people together and we can, you know, get people to do things and encourage the team in a way that a lot of times other people can't. Mm -hmm. And so that's to me sort of the flip side of the likability thing is, yeah, you know, sometimes it helps to have that, that insight. I, I come from a male dominated industry uh, in automotive and I have been complimented and I've tried to be recruited by other leaders in my industry because they know that about women. Mm -hmm. They really do. They know that that's a super secret power that we have and they know that they don't have it. Yeah. <laughs> I've been trying, I have been trying to be recruited out of my own family business into another <laughs> empire because <laughs> I've been the only woman at these you know, a, a sales events with all these other dudes. So yeah, it's true. So it is, it is a secret power that we have. So, and I don't know, I don't know that I've ever had somebody say specifically to me, um, you need to be more likable. I mean, I've had, there's been code words around it. You need to be less assertive. Um, don't come across so bitchy, you know, those kinds of things that maybe they're telling me uh, you're not being very likable. But knowing that, that we do have that, we do have that secret, secret superpower. I like that, Jill. I, I think I'm going to put it's that on a t-shirt. I'm yeah, a but, little regretting using the word secret. <laughs> it's just a flat out superpower. A superpower. I, ask me about my superpower. Right. <laughs> Right. But we, we do have that, you know, and I think that it makes us probably, well, here's a thought, you guys. Does it make us more sensitive to whether we're being likable or not? And so we, we pull back sometimes in an effort to make everyone more comfortable and be more collaborative and pull people in. Um, and, you know, so that we're even more aware of it than maybe other people are. I think that's probably true. Uh, in my industry, working with really being the only woman in a whole shop of men and working with them, there's been times I've had to go in my office and shut the door and be like, I don't even know how they're talking to each other that way because it's so offensive to me and I'm so sad, like being super sensitive, but they're fine. They're fine. They're like, they're communicating, they're getting things done. To me, when I'm out there, I, and I don't want to seem super sensitive um, and emotional, I, but it, it has affected me to where it's been such a negative experience and I have to go just kind of like breathe. And I, and I work with my husband, so then I tell him, God, you guys are so mean to each other, you know, but, <laughs> but there, he's just like, no, that's just how we talk. We're fine. Um, so, yeah. Hmm. yeah. I don't know. Um, I do think we quiet down <clears throat> to keep the peace. Um, I know I definitely take a back seat, and I also really like to hear everybody's opinions and thoughts before I'll share mine. So these Zoom panels where I can't just listen and partake, it's hard. Um, but <laughs> I, you're I, on I, the hot seat when you're one I'm of on the hot seat. people. <laughs> yeah, um, but I think that's that's collaboration. As long as um, like we don't bow our our feelings and our thoughts um, because of what we're hearing, and we stay strong that way, that's a real challenge for me there. Um, not to be swayed to keep the peace. Um, 
so I'll, I'll stay quiet. Um, but I also, Susie, to your point where they're so offensive to each other and then they're fine, I think, again, they've been programmed to grow up that way, that, that um, that's expected. Mm. Yeah. Again, I'm on the other side, right? I always believed the victim and the Me Too campaign um, until I had a son and realized what they have to go through, and my son got falsely accused. Um, and so I think that living on the other side has made my understanding and empathy so much stronger that we don't, I never knew what men went through. They are just as sensitive and yeah. just as caring, but it is be out of them at a very young age that mm -hmm. that is, don't be a pussy. Don't be, you know, all these things where for us girls, don't cry, um, don't be so sensitive. It's the same thing on that side. Um, so I would say working with so many men at this point, that um, millennials, that they are just as sweet and caring and as a woman and can be just as emotional as us. Mm -hmm. um, and there are women who are logical and thinkers and would rather shoot their foot off than cry anytime, right? I, I think the stereotype goes both ways, um, but I would say that a lot of these men have been raised to believe that you have to be macho and say these mean things to each other. Mm. And have, having spent um, close to 20 years in the military, now true, I, I come from the old, I'm a Vietnam vet, mm -hmm. so a while ago, and when we started, we were not part of the men's army. Um, I love the fact that we had to lower our standards in order to join the men's army. I thought that was really interesting. Um, and so where, where I'm seeing this is the men in the military don't know what to do with us. You know, it's, it's like, how do, how do we treat her? You know, we, if, can I treat her like uh, all the other men. Can I say those things to her or around her or whatever? Is she going to cry? You know, what's she going to do? And in some respects, they're tiptoeing around just as much as we are mm -hmm. trying to figure out, you know, how, how do I, she's, she's a fellow soldier. She's one of my team. She's going to be out there now in the front lines, which um, was, was not the case for so long. And so you know, the, the best person might be a woman who needs to go out and build that runway um, and all that, which, which is very different for them. And so, you know, they also have that huge macho thing. And even more so, I think, in the military than elsewhere, because they're out there fighting the battles and, and being shot at and likely to, you know, run into something that they can't control. And so, you know, they, they sort of want their women in the back in, in, they would love us back behind the lines uh, yeah. rather than as part of the team uh, up front. Um, their, their fear is, I have to take care of you. Um, I had, uh, I listened to a woman who is one of the few women who have earned the Ranger tab, and she said that during her course, she spent so much time convincing them that the rangers tab that they got because she graduated with them would not be devalued because they didn't lower the standards she said didn't i carry a 75 pound pack just like you did and i love this one didn't i haul your sorry ass from out there because you were wounded and brought you back did anyone help me did i have to carry this gigantic gun and what did you carry the little tripod that it sits on <laughs> you know, I've done everything that's been asked of me that a male would have to do. So I don't see where you think that the ranger tab is going to be diminished because I graduate with you. Mm -hmm. I wonder if, if um, as you work on projects collaboratively with people, that kind of facade falls away. You know, like you're, you're saying she had to describe it, to defend her tab to the people she worked with. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember exactly when this happened, and the, and I'm wondering if that was her defending it to outsiders who were, you know, or to actual insiders who she worked with, who could see her, like who could watch her carry people and carry the gun and do all the things that they did. Yeah, she was, she was defending herself with other people in the course, other wow. men in the course. And the other thing she said is the Ranger Tab is designed for 20-somethings. And she was a 41-year-old woman. So not only did she have, 
gender discrimination, but she also had age discrimination. The fact that they're going, well, you can't possibly be able to do this. I'm a 20 year old man, I can do it. Um, and yet she and t at least two other women made it through, got the tab and have been rewarded for it. Um, and I just think it's, it's, it's just really powerful. The fact that, you know, one, they did it um, and that they are being very out there about what it took to make that happen. So did that make her more likable or less likable? <laughs> um, I think they more tolerable. <laughs> I'm not sure likable. Mm -hmm. uh, because again, the, the men in the military right now are, are still a little cautious about the fact that we are integrated into um, the man's army, as it could be. I think one of the, the, the things that we do a disservice to the women is we don't tell them their history. Like, what did it take for women to get where they are today? Mm -hmm. I know the, the ranger, the woman that spoke on her ranger tab, she said, I did it because I didn't want my daughter ever to have to say, I couldn't do this because I was a woman. Yeah. I wanted to show that any woman could do this if they had the heart and soul and desire to make it happen. And I thought that was really powerful, but I wanted to ask her, I said, do you know what it took to get you where you are today? <laughs> what, what it took women like me right, right. Um, who were in... A, definitely it was two cores um we had our own headquarters we had our own flagpole we did our own ceremonies we did our own everything and you know to be a part of the military now to have it integrated it it's going to take a while for it to settle in i have to be honest well you know to to what jill said though um when it seems like when you get over the hump you know like of if you're working on a team you're working within a department you're working in a group whatever and regardless of what people felt about you at the beginning sometimes after you've proven yourself or or you know you've gone through a few little skirmishes together and you and the team's had a few wins some of that stuff falls away because now you're part of of the team I think the challenge when, when we talk about likability is getting, getting past that. Let's imagine, let's imagine that it's 2020 and we have a female president, okay? Will, how long will we still be saying that? Or will it be, okay, that's a done thing. It's, a, it's been decided, you know, uh, so-and-so has been elected president. Are we going to keep talking about whether she's likable? Or is it only that thing of getting over the hump? getting the job or getting the promotion or becoming president or whatever the case may be. You know, once you've bridged that, does that go away? I, I don't think so. Okay. I don't think it will go away. I don't, I think that it's a conscious thing. It's so embedded in our culture. I think women are actually harder on other women than men are. That's my opinion. And especially in my, my, in my world, um, I think it's a consciousness that we have to, as, a, as older, older generations, I think it's even harder for that generation to learn. And I think the younger people are over it faster than we are. Oh. And the, the likability portion of it. Um, but I would love to see a woman present. But, but to, honestly, I think that she's going to be held at a different, um, a, a different standard. It, she, she's going to be graded on everything. Oh, yeah. Everything she that she does, she wears her word choices, absolutely everything. When we have someone that says whatever he wants, and mm -hmm. he does, you know. So I think I think it's going to take the the becoming the next step and doing those bigger jobs. But we have to embrace each other and change. It's a consciousness. It has to evolve. Mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we still don't have women in a tremendous amount of leadership positions. No, we don't. Across, you know, government, companies, et cetera, you know, pick a category, military, oh. anything. I mean, they're there. They're just not there in tremendous numbers. And I wonder if it will take going through a generation of women growing up and getting to those peak um, experiences in greater numbers to help um, change things. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. So, you know, to go back to the idea of, of like newscasters, for example, um, 
on, on NBC, on the Today Show, you know, they've been through a number of women anchors. You know, there was Katie Couric and, you know, then Meredith Vieira and then, you know, all these, all these different ones. And we had Matt Lauer. <laughs> and, and I remember from, I mean, probably 20 years ago, listening to that guy interview people and thinking, God, what a jerk. What a jerk. Like, who gave him a microphone? And, and I'm, I'm, I have no problem saying that on a, <laughs> on a recording. I, it was like, what a jerk. But nobody ever, that's not what brought him down. His likability or lack thereof did not bring him down. It was, you know, finally all of his past, you know, discretions catching up with him. But we went through cute little Katie Couric. Oh, she's so cute. Everybody likes her. You know, she's just really so cute. And then what, what was her name? It was Anne, um, uh, he got her fired because she was, she was popular. She was smart. She was, I can see her in my mind and I can't think of her name. Anne Curry. Anne Curry. And it was, I mean, she was brilliant and he got her fired because she was smarter than he was. And, and it showed up very clearly. And then Meredith Fiera came on and she wouldn't put up with his BS and then she was gone. And you know, so you, it, it was this constant revolving door at, at the Today Show about likable women, um, women that were subservient to him or that would, you know, go along with, with him. And to me, that was, I mean, if we just talk about news, we could talk about politics and likability all day long. But if we just talk about news, that was a, a brilliant little microcosm of what did likability really look like? You know, I, I don't know that did anybody ever say, hey, is Matt Lauer likable? You know, I don't, I don't I know. But the, the weather girls on the news right now are like, they're wearing <laughs> cocktail dresses and they're like, woo. Yeah. <laughs> likeable? <laughs> What's that about? They're, I think they're very likable. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Susie, Susie, Susie. <laughs> I don't watch the news, so I'm not even going to partake in this, but I can say like Megan Rapino right now, right? She's shouldering a whole lot of stuff. You as women's national soccer team. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. They got in trouble for celebrating after they scored, um, but this is just what they did after they scored to come together as a team, but they still got, you know, hit hard on it. Um, and what I've really been impressed with about by Megan Rapino is that she's willing to shoulder all of this. Mm -hmm. She's not like me, don't like me, still show up, fight for equality. Um, and to me, that's who we need. The person who's gonna say, it doesn't matter. Um, we need everybody to come together. Even the you know, people who aren't like me come together. People who, you know? So I think for me, those are the role models that we need to see. Um, and the people who will be blatantly saying, you don't need to like me. You need to hear this message. Totally um, agree. That's so. awesome. I think that's totally true. agree. But, but then look at Megan. She's a she's a millennial, is she not? Exactly. Oh no, she, Megan. She's so much. She's older. She's yeah. She's, she's older. She's, 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 yeah. She's in her thirties, isn't she? Millennials. Go millennials. Into, millennials like, 30 30. She's late thirties. I want to say though. Oh, um, okay. I think she's like thirty nine. Oh, yeah. Is she like 38, 39? On the cusp, yeah. Yeah, maybe on the cusp. Those are Gen Xers. She's old. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Gen okay. X. She's older than me, so all I'm saying is like. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, um, I, I think that that attitude is what we need. Somebody who stands for what they believe in and and doesn't sure. doesn't go down that path. It's like, um, I mean, I wonder if if some of the women that are running for office now, if they get, you know, I'm just imagining the campaign meetings where they say, oh, you know, Elizabeth, your likability numbers are in the toilet, you know. You know, I hope that she says something like, well, you know, okay, so what? I'm, I'm still going to be me, and, and I'm, not, I'm not endorsing her or, or not endorsing her. I'm just saying it would be great if they did a Megan and said, this is what I am. This is what I believe in. This is, you know, take it or leave it. She has an amazing story. She has an amazing backstory as well in her family. So, well, can you all hear me? Yes, ma'am. Hi, Velma. <laughs> Hi, Velma. I'm Velma, and I'm sorry I showed up late, but I've been here from the beginning, and I just just dawned on me I didn't plug my camera in. 
<laughs> so, but I've been listening all the time. Do you have a comment, something to add to the? No, um, I've just been kind of listening and in, in, in a lot of things I totally agree with. I think that as far as likability on my part um, and being African-American, I walk in knowing that you don't like me. <laughs> so mm -hmm. to me, that's not, um, um, to me, it's not really a major issue because I always tell myself, you just don't know me yet. No. So um, mm. I, don't, I don't really take a, put a lot of emphasis on that mm -hmm. because I know that's, that's the problem usually, and that's usually what happened. I mean, there are some people who probably still don't like me, but um, they can't say it's because of, of anything that I've done personally to them. You know, sometimes people just look at you and say, oh, I don't like you. But um, I don't put too much weight on it. And um, I think that was uh, Noel. Chris. Monique. Chris. Mo Chris, who was t talking about her daughter. No, Susie? Monique. You mean Monique? Me? Okay, was talking about your daughters? Yeah, uh, well, we were, me and Susie both talked about our daughters. Your badass daughters? <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's Susie. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you're on your team, Monique. <laughs> I, 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 I feel the same way. I'm like, give that some thumbs up because uh, I have a badass daughter. I have some two badass nieces that um, uh, I helped to raise. Uh, my sister and I, we were both single parents. So we took on this job together and um, you know, I'm really proud to say that all of them are doing very well in the fields that they have chosen to, to, to be, I mean, they're like at the top of their, their skills at, at their jobs they have. And, uh, one of my nieces is a, um, actress, um, Terry Vaughn and, um, the courage she had. Uh, when she stepped out to to do that because uh, she was going to school for marketing mm -hmm. and um, she has still one semester to, to go to, to get her degree but she just all of a sudden decided that she wants to be an actress mm -hmm. so um, she uh, got a part in a play and the play took off and they left town and she came back and they did another play it took off they went traveling she came back and decided she wanted to go to Hollywood and be an actress. And that's exactly what she did. So yeah, we have some, I have some, some badass young women around and a couple of granddaughters who are some badasses also. So um, yeah, I, I agree with that. And the part about the millenniums, they don't care about it. If you like them or not. I, I don't think they even think about if you like them or not. Um, because they're so focused on what it is they want. They're very selfish people is what I say. <laughs> yeah, I agree. <laughs> they're very selfish because it's all about me and what I want and how I want to do it. Um, it's just like my granddaughter. She Now she decided she wants to be a, a, a beautician. She went on and she just did just that. She went to school and got her a license. That's the only reason she went to school because she had to have the license. She had been doing everybody's hair. And she's only been doing that professionally for about two years, two, three years now. And um, this year, she was recommended to go to um, New York for Fashion Week and do the hair of the models. Um, so, I mean, wow. who would have thought, you know, you've just been doing this, what, two years or so? But yeah, they, they are some badasses and they just, and, and I think that's because a, a lot of it has to do with me because I just feel like you just decide what you want to do and you just go do that. <laughs> because um, I always told them, you can do anything you want, you can have anything you want. And anybody who says you can't, you let me know who that is because I'm here to tell them that you can. So yeah, this is good. You know, I wonder, I wonder if, uh, uh, if this is less prevalent in entrepreneurism than it is like in corporate or in, in things that have a, a more um, formal construct, you know, like, um, like in corporate or like in news or like in uh, politics or, you know, something that's more formally uh, organized is there do we, does this show up more there well I want I'd like to ask Linda 
And to go into the military, you're not caring of who likes you or at all. I mean, as a woman, <laughs> when you went in, like, what was that like? You had to like, not, it had to not matter to you if anybody, if a man or woman liked you for doing what you went did when, yeah. by the way, thank you for your service. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, I would agree. I mean, I went, I went in in the seventies um, when men were not going in, um, you know, they were trying to avoid the draft as much as possible. I actually went in um, partly because my dad had been in the Navy and the Marine Corps during the war. Mm. Yes. World war two. Um, and you're right. I didn't care because, I mean, the, we could not be pregnant. We couldn't get married. You know, all the, so it's sort of like, who stays? Who becomes the senior leaders? And, you know, they, they primarily were lesbians. And they were the most powerful women that I have ever met because they knew who they were. They were comfortable in what they were. And they were very clear um, when we come to Fort McClellan, they were very clear that we we set our sexuality. Are you homosexual? Are you heterosexual? Because it made a difference as to how they treated you, but it had nothing to do with likability. Um, if you did the job and you did it well, and you were at the top of your game, <clears throat> you got promoted, you got medals, you 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 got the assignments that you wanted. I ended up as the protocol officer for a four-star general. Had nothing to do with likability. It had to do with, you know, what I what I had achieved at that time, what he saw in me, and the fact that I was willing to um, hold him accountable for things. Um, I have I have a great story about Chef Salad that sometime I will share with you all, um, and and yet, you know, I I didn't care. Uh, the cool thing was I I was a um, a student officer between my or in my senior year at college. I had a green card, which said I was active duty. It was active duty uh, at that time, a corporal. And I could go anywhere another active duty person could go. So I could go to the PX. I could go, you know, that kind of thing. And we had all the ROTC guys who were all Air Force. And I didn't have to do anything that year at all. And I got paid $350 a month to do nothing. <laughs> they had to go to class. They had to go to formation. They had to dress appropriately. And there was a, a certain jealousy about the fact that how did you get to do what you do when I have to do all of this stuff? And I, I, I loved it. <laughs> I really it was really your did. one and only time, dear. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you know, we, I was able to get us into the PX in Munich um, when we went uh, on we, we did a year, or excuse me, we did a month in Europe, and we were studying the economic institutions of, of Europe, and this gentleman came from the PX to tell about, because this was a huge PX in Munich, and so he tells us all about it, and he says, do you have any questions? And I raised my hand, and I said, yes, could you tell me where the PX is? He said, oh, ma'am, you can't go there unless you have a dependent card or a green card, and I went like this. He said, it's over there. <laughs> <laughs> in the hours or so I cash checks for everybody so when we went to Paris everybody had money but yeah I, I I had some interesting experiences coming out my first job interview the guy said to me yeah you know, he said tell me what you did in the military so I did and he said no no tell me what you really did in the military mm -hmm. you know why women are really in the military and I said thank you and and left because his opinion of women in the military was that we were all pros. Wow. We were there strictly for, to find a husband and for sex. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Now, needless to say, you quote, can't do that these days. But yeah, that was my first job interview coming out of the military. Damn. Mm -hmm. Jill, what, what do you think about about what I just said, as far as maybe some of this shows up more in a corporate const construct than uh, you were saying that uh, you were asking, do entrepreneurs preneurs see this? Uh -huh. And I think they do in a more subtle way. If you look at the funding numbers for uh -huh. what kinds of money gets poured into entrepreneurial ventures, the money far and away 
gets poured into male founders versus female founders, as an example. Um, there are lots of statistics on this. So right. that to me says it's still, it's still pretty rampant out there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, that, that's kind of where the rubber meets the road is cash flow. Yeah. And if we can't bring cash flow into our businesses, then we don't grow as founders and leaders, et cetera. Yeah. So is that a likability factor or a trust factor or what's at the core of it? I, I, I wouldn't, I don't know that I could put my finger on exactly one thing, but it's definitely still there. Yeah. Well, you know, and that's interesting that you say likability and trust because, you know, the, the whole trust thing is, is huge. Once you've established trust with somebody, then they'll, they'll pretty much do anything with right. you. you know, they'll go to the mat with you, but if, if there's no trust there, and what gets in the way of building that trust, you know, is um, there's just a lot of layers to that, to that onion. Yeah, well, and as, as you were saying, um, Velma, is it, I think? Velma. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, if someone's not even willing to let you in, like if they've judged you just by showing up, they have judged you, then you can never get to that level of trust where you can then work together and build a foundation for a stronger relationship. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I, I wonder if it's trust because I think a lot of times when you're going in to look at funding for funding and talk money, um, it's usually with a man. Mm -hmm. And, um, I, you know, I owned a club. I had a club for about, um, I guess I was, <laughs> I guess I held on for about seven or eight years. But I was never able to get the kind of funding or anybody to look at me seriously although it had it turned out to be a major event here in san, here in san francisco and um um when the when the when the economy dropped that's when i started really having problems because nobody had money then so of course entertainment was the last thing on their list Mm -hmm. So um, I just had to make a decision to either close it, it was either me or the club. Mm -hmm. But it's funny because after I closed the club, um, a man called me and asked me if he could buy my name because the club had gotten to be so popular across the country that he wanted to keep that momentum and that and that name going and I told him absolutely not so um but so I wonder if it's trust because they don't even give you allow you a chance to even get to that point with them or I I wonder if it's um do you think I don't I don't know enough or I can I I can never figure out what it is I I I just consider it, you a man and you're looking at me a woman. Um, as a matter of fact, that's the only reason I even opened the club. I never thought about being a club owner. That was never in my uh, psychic. But what happened was I was, um, I was doing these events, these blues events on Sundays, and I called it the Sunday Blues and Jazz Club. And uh, that's another whole story about how I even decided to do that. But what happened was, the space I was in, I got a call from the city of San Francisco, the mayor's office representative, the, the uh, uh, chamber of commerce, the entertainment commission, you know, all these people called me and wanted me to come in and have a meeting with them. And I mean, I was scared to death because I'm like, what the hell am I doing? <laughs> so, <laughs> but when I got there, they were talking about they wanted me to purchase the space that I was in. And I was just there on Sundays. And um, then offer me not one nickel. I don't even, I still haven't figured out what, what, what it was all about. I kind of have an idea, but. Um, so what, and what upset me was the fact that they sat there in my face and told me, you know, the city is closing down to you all's music. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'm looking at them, I'm like, uh, excuse me? Uh, yeah. The city is closing down to you all's music because at that time, I think I was probably the only African-American club owner who was presenting live music 
as like I was, you know, I was bringing in major musician, musicians and artists and um, who don't ever come to the African-American community, let alone San, they didn't come to San Francisco. But uh, when I started bringing them in, then some of the higher up of clubs in San Francisco started bringing a few of them in. But um, I, um, I could not figure out why they even wanted me to do that. But I got angry and I said to myself, you know, whatever their motives are, I think they're probably thinking that I can't do this. And I had made a pact with myself. <laughs> You're going to open this club if you don't have it but one day. I have no funding from anybody. Um, but I figured it out. Uh, and, I, and I told them, the only way I'll do this is that I have to own everything. I own the building. I own the liquor license. I own the catering license. I even had a license that allowed uh, youth to come in because of the way that the, uh, the, the club was situated. Uh, I had a restaurant, a little restaurant, and uh, the bar and the showroom were like not in the same little space. Mm -hmm. So I could have uh, young people into the club. So I did events for young people and all kinds of things. It was a wonderful space. And um, I think if I had been able to hold on, boy, oh boy, everybody would know me there by now because it was <laughs> major. It was major. And um, um, as a matter of fact, when I had Jerry Butler come one New Year's Eve and KQED called me and wanted to interview him. And uh, I mean, because I mean, he's, uh, you know, everybody knows Jerry Butler, right? <laughs> so um, he they, I said, well, I'll have to ask him. And he told me to tell them the only way he'll interview th with them, they have to come to the club. Nice. And they did. They came in with all their cameras and things. And and um, they talked to me a little bit. And I was just like, one of the statements I remember, because they kind of looked at me funny. I said, you know, I'm not understanding something. I said, when a city like San Francisco prides itself in their cultural diversities, and I don't see me, there's a problem. <laughs> And I left it like that. <laughs> think so ladies, we're, we're just about at the end of our okay. time here. So I'm just curious, uh, you know, this, con this is what happens in the ladies room is that the conversations start here and then they go over there and then they go down here and then they come back over here. That's what I love about being in the ladies room. So any last thoughts anybody wants to, to share about likability? What's, what's the hope for the future in terms of... Uh likeability. Yeah. Um, I have to say that I think we as women leaders, we have to speak up when we see somebody else struggling with that likeability feature. And we are who we protect. Nice. So we want to walk the walk, talk the talk, and, and be examples of what we want the world to be. And um, I think that's just we lead by example, period. That's Absolutely. Yeah, we educate our daughters and the younger generation. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Yeah. Chris, come on, say something. We're gonna, I know you're sitting back there. You're, you're doing your, your uh, CS oh. disc thing where you sit back and you- Listening, I'm observing. You listen. Um, I think the biggest thing that I like to do is a lot like Linda says, I like to know what's come before me um, in order to move forward and with a vision. Um, and my biggest thing is it's not about if we are good enough, um, it's their perception and their own insecurities. So if we bounce off of their insecurities and try to frame ourselves around them, we keep losing who we are in that. Um, so I, I really focus on um, that I'm, I'm being authentic to who I am in order to make space for the people coming behind me. Great. Awesome. 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 How about you, Jill? You got some last statements, last minute thoughts? I know everybody's had such really wonderful insights. I'm just kind of soaking it in and I'm not usually on that side of the disc profile. So that's a <laughs> <laughs> I'm on the way other side. Um, yeah, I, I, I would agree with everyone who says you really have to own it and help people who can't own it 
yeah. by showing them or role modeling or maybe, you know, having some insight about why they can't own it um, to get them there. Yeah. Um, I love that. I love. And we that. also need to call out people that are judging or, or liking, yeah. judging someone else for something that really doesn't matter. If yeah. they're smart and they're competent, hey, let them do what they need to do. Yeah. Period. Yeah. yeah. Very much. Let them play soccer. Yeah. Yeah. Let them, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let them run everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Linda, you got any last statements there? I, I agree so with Chris and Jill. I think um, we have to role model it. We have to mentor it. Um, we have to step in, step out, step up, and really, you know, improve our game and call people on it. Um, not, not necessarily rely on being likable. I mean, I, I have to tell you that this morning there were moments when I went, gee, I hope people like the book. <laughs> um, so, I mean, there, there are still vestiges of that. Yes. Um, and I, I think we have to um, really be there for the group that's coming up to really mm -hmm. demonstrate and be there as a role model of what life should be like, what relationships should be like, what leadership should be like, so that they have a, a springboard from which to rise. Yeah. Let's be there for one another. Yeah. And, and eventually this likability thing will be muted out of our uh, out of society. So yep. well, right. thank you so much for joining us here in the ladies room. And I want to thank my special guests. I want to thank Linda Patton and I want to thank Chris Noel and Jill Carpenter. Thank you so much for being here as my special guests and all of you that joined us online. Um, I'm, I'm really pleased to have had you here. It's been a very rich conversation. And be sure that you share this. We'll, it'll be recorded. It'll be out on the Connected Women of Influence website in probably the next week or so. And we can share that. And, uh, and just keep looking for the ones that we have coming up over the next month. And there's always something going on in the ladies' room. <laughs> have a wonderful rest of your day, ladies. Okay. Take care. You, you too. Bye-bye. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye.